puppies, kittens, hatchlings. They're all babies. And chances are, you were once a baby too. You can call me Norris, and I'm working on a STEM-based creature collector. And throughout my videos, I've been sharing my designs and explaining the science concepts behind them. But today's conversation is going to start with explaining the design process as we'll write this baby train of thought before I show you my creature. So let's start by asking, how do you make a baby? Design. Two words. Big head. Look at the human baby. They outratio an adult's head to body ratio. Because while the head still grows a little, the rest of the body grows more dramatically to properly deal with the physical world. And the same goes for most vertebrates. But that's not all. Because babies also have big eyes, relatively. Rest of the face gets bigger and looser than the eyeballs do as we age. Now, eyes play a major role in a design as characters and art styles are often recognized just due to the way the eyes are drawn. Our brains have a whole section dedicated to recognizing faces, and that area is called the fusiform face area. A 2017 study in Japan had an epileptic patient who had surgery near this region of the brain. The study then electrically activated this region and asked the patient what they saw. Despite looking at the random objects, they were able to see a face. But pay attention to the wording that they're using. What constitutes a face here? Eyes and a mouth. That's just how important eyes are in a design. By the way, links to videos like these would be down in the description. Now this study actively triggered the brain to see a face where there wasn't a face. But most people can passively see faces as long as there's two dots and a well-positioned line. This is pareidolia, where our pattern-seeking minds perceive an image to look like something that it's really not. So as eyes are very important in recognizing characters, baby designs not only have large heads, but they usually also have relatively large eyes. You know, this shot of the Garfield movie trailer prompted me to make this video. Look at this baby! You're gonna get a lot of that from me today. But this babyfication has been common especially in cartoon franchises. Now is this the end of humanity? Is society ruined? No, it's it's just a direction. Some people like it, some won't. And there are times when a majority of people find a baby character endearing, and sometimes it falls flat. So there's this whole TV trope called spin-off babies, describing how many established shows or franchises would have a spin-off version of themselves, featuring their characters as babies. First ones credited to be Muppet Babies from 1984, where the cast of the Muppets are drawn as babies with, again, big heads and eyes. And in a drawn medium like cartoons, making a baby version is much easier to achieve because you just need to redraw them instead of hiring a child actor who's estimated to look like a previous actor. But are these shows successful? More often than not, spin-offs in general do not do as well as the original. And these baby shows don't seem to be an exception. Several others seem to also ask why these baby versions exist instead of straight up making new shows for their younger demographic. On paper, maybe it's to bridge the gap between the age differences of a family and maybe higher ups push for more shows of a familiar franchise. However, this trope doesn't end in television. Video games also have a few examples of making baby versions of previous characters. Sega's Echo the Dolphin is infamous for the game's difficulty, but in three years they would make Echo Jr., which is much more accessible to younger players with the addition of difficulty settings and a generally more friendlier atmosphere than the origin. The heck is going on in the original Echo? Ah! Super Mario was also hit with the baby Inator, as he's a tiny baby in the Yoshi Island games. And from what I've read, the Yoshi Island games are also on the easier side compared to previous Mario games. But is that what babies are supposed to represent in gaming? Not just the babyfication of the character, but also easier gameplay? Well, it's not always the case. Pokemon has had a unique history with babies. After the initial Pokemania boom at the turn of the century, Pokemon wanted to make a sequel. 
this second generation of Pokemon games would be very much linked to the first ones with related characters and eventually linking the map to the first area. Now when it comes to the creature designs, what could you do to reference the creatures of the original 151? You can make completely new Pokemon that are counterparts with the old ones. But the more recognizable addition would be adding a new evolution to the line, where an old Pokemon now has access to some special items or requirements to further evolve into a bigger, stronger monster. But is that the only direction you could take? Pokemon has maintained and gradually grown their popularity throughout the years due to their appeal to wider ranges of personal tastes. The new additions didn't just have gnarly designs, but also some additions were babies, pre-evolutions. If new evolutions can be achieved through new items though, the babies were achieved through a new mechanic, breeding. While everyone can breed, a few Pokemon can hatch a new cute baby form that's perfect to become marketable plushies. Heck, there's even a few anime episodes just about these babies. But here's the thing, how can you justify these additional baby forms in the game? Sure, they're super cute, but if they grow up the visual is lost, while continuing to play as the baby would prove to be difficult. What sick man sends babies to fight. See, players would use the breeding mechanics to get better stats, and again, every Pokemon can breed. Then having a baby form, which cannot breed, actively makes the grind for better stats harder and longer to do. And for most of the babies in the games, the way to evolve them is not just by leveling them up, but is by giving them high amounts of friendship. I wonder if Game Freak was aware of this, because in Generation 3, there were only two new babies. But uh-oh, Meryl and Wobbuffet existed when the breeding mechanic was introduced. Why didn't they make baby forms back then? So Pokemon introduced the incenses, which are items the parent needs to hold while breeding to make the baby form. And these items were also given other gameplay to hopefully further justify their existence. In Pokemon's fourth generation, there are a lot of new additions to previous lines, both new evolutions and new pre-evolutions. Incenses are everywhere, baby, each with their own effect to justify their usefulness. Additionally, babies have access to even more moves than if the Pokemon skipped that stage, and babies caught in the wild would grow up to have better stats than catching the adult version. See. Now if a new Pokemon is introduced with a baby form, like Lucario's Ryolu, they don't need any incense or any justification as to why you couldn't see the baby before. But this whole time we've been talking about the baby Pokemon category, which is a well-defined group within the game. But there are still many other cute and baby-like Pokemon that aren't in this group. Pikachu used to be the de facto cute one of the roster, but whoop, now it has an even babier form with Pichu. Turns out, Pokemon can continue to have cute baby-like designs to make plushies with big heads and eyes, but just don't apply the baby Pokemon label in the game. So ever since Generation 4, there were no more additions to the baby Pokemon category until more than a decade later in Sword and Shield's Toxel, who is a purple lizard with a diaper. In the latest pair of games though, Scarlet and Violet, these incense requirements are outright retconned, where every Pokemon with a baby form just hatches as that baby, further questioning the usefulness of this baby Pokemon label used in the games. Now, my project wouldn't have a separate baby category. In fact, I'm not thinking about any sort of breeding mechanic because I need to start with a smaller scope. But I did have two designs that I would have personally called babies. One of which I already went over in a previous video. And the other is about static electricity. When you wear some fuzzy socks and walk on the carpet, the socks are stealing electrons from the carpet, causing an imbalance of electrons. This imbalance is static electricity. Static means not moving because the imbalance charge remains to be separate, as that static only gets released when the electrons find a surface to get out of you. So here's my baby raccoon stuck kit, who is hungry for electrons, with her tail almost looking like a grabby hand. 
Though the abilities I have here are from Pokemon, they would have different names and or effects. And the reason why I gave Stakit plus here is because they're in need of electrons, where the electrons are negatively charged. Plus wants electrons. Prokion is no longer a baby and has minus as an ability because they are full of electrons. They also got a large spiky top, like how hair spreads out when somebody has a lot of static electricity, because charges of the same type repel each other, and having an excess of electrons makes the hair strands all negatively charged and repel each other. I hope you learned a thing or two about our baby discussion today. From big heads to you getting a big head for learning about some physics, huh? I don't know. But thank you for watching till the end. If you liked it, you can always share and subscribe to my channel. And a big thank you to my Patreon subscribers for directly supporting the channel and my project. I'm still making weekly dev vlogs about my progress in Godot over there. But if you want to see more from me, I got a whole series right here on YouTube going over my Stemma project. Alright, thank you again for watching and enjoy the season.